Um, we are hopefully uh, going to parse that out uh, this morning and talk about what does transfiguration even mean. We're about to start a sermon series for Lent um, that's going to be questions Jesus asked. If you remember in the fall leading up to Advent, we were talking about questions we, the people, the congregation had. And so our text this morning is actually a precursor to that because it is an answer to a question asked by Jesus, now answered by Jesus. And as you will see, our text actually begins this morning six days later. So it does imply that we have read chapter 16. So if you turn one page back, if you have your Bible, um, if not, you're just going to have to believe me. Um, in Matthew 16, there is a conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples in which he asks them, who do people say I am? And the disciples answer, some say that you're John the Baptist, but others say you're Elijah. Still others think that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Peter correctly answers that Jesus is the Messiah, which is really exciting because Jesus gives him accolades that last a few verses and then immediately pretty much turn into a rebuke. Remember when Jesus tells Peter to get behind him, Satan. That's great. Um, so, and then... Um, but, but really, it's a moment where Peter, he, he so passionately wants to prevent suffering because it's in the moment that Jesus tells him that he's going to have to die and that he's going to suffer. And Peter wants to jump in. So it's actually from a really beautiful place that Peter's coming from. Um, and then it leads into our text this morning, which is the beginning of Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9 says, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and then led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up. And do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Please pray with me. God, I pray that you would illuminate our minds this morning to what it is that you are doing in our text, but also what you are doing in the world. Lord, I pray that your words be spoken this morning, that you would hide me behind the cross of Christ so that you may be truly honored and glorified this day and forevermore. Amen. So I was reading this story this week, and, and this video from a few years back kept popping into my mind. It was actually a video that one day I, I just shared um, as part of a, a hospice team meeting um, just to, to shine some light, to, to give kind of a, a fun moment. But I, there's this great hat up here. <laughs> Sorry, it keeps hitting my leg. Okay, so, so um, I saw this video a few years back, and I still love this video, and it makes me smile every time I see it. Unfortunately, it's a little long, so I'm not going to play it, but I highly recommend you go look it up later this afternoon. In this video, the singer Adele, do we all know Adele? Okay, because I can't impersonate her. But Adele dresses up in disguise, and she shows up for this audition 
of Adele impersonators. Okay, the people who've seen this are nodding and they're with me. So this is not what Adele looks like, but this is how um, they dressed her up. Wait, wait, don't go too fast. They go back to the first one, because um, if, if you know Adele, she has like a bump in her chin, so they put on a fake prosthetic chin, and she, that's a fake nose, so, and they redid her hair and, and all this. And she comes in the video, and she's talking, and she, she says, you know, I usually talk like this, and so she lowers her voice, and she starts talking very slowly. So it is actually hard, to, a little tricky to tell that it's her. Okay, so now you can go to the slide two. So she shows up, and um, she's standing backstage, so she's um, in the far corner, um, of this picture and she's standing among um, these other singers and they're talking about their gigs that they have as, as pretending to be Adele and um, she they're actually complaining that um, it's taken her so long to release the second CD and she's like oh I know <laughs> like, there's just the same songs over and over again um, there were four years in between the albums um, between her debut and then her follow-up and then there's even this male impersonator who is singing and one of the other Adele's remarks to Adele she says gosh I think Adele would really like him and Adele is kind of getting choked up and she's like I do too I think Adele would really like him um, and then the moment arrives Adele is the last one to go out and audition and she's been pretending to be really nervous backstage and so all of these other Adele impersonators they're just with her they just want her to get out there and do okay <laughs> like they, they really don't have much expectation for it and so all of a sudden Adele probably sings one note and a couple of the impersonators like they just turn to shock because well, first you think, well, is it just because they're so impressed that she's so good? So go ahead, Kyle, next picture. This is, that's, that's the male impersonator who's like, what? <laughs> and then Adele starts saying, and, and I mean, her voice is just so powerful and beautiful. And she kicks off her shoes, which is like her signature thing that she does at her, her concert. And you see the faces of these people just light up. And they're so excited and they get it and and just i love like that's her face the most she's like that's her and um by the end of this video all of the impersonators are singing with adele and you just get this incredible moment of these people who love someone so much realizing that they have been not only in her presence but they get to sing with her and afterwards you see her interacting with them and it's so special and it it does just really create this joy so i invite you to go and watch it and i and i thought of this video i think because i was trying to to put into words that joy that knowledge that dawning awareness that that small group of disciples must have had when all of a sudden jesus is the the greek word for transfiguration is metamorphosis he he literally physically changes in front of them and becomes so bright and then all of a sudden we, we have Moses and Elijah are there I mean the great spiritual heroes are, are standing with Jesus Christ all of a sudden everything comes into clarity they know that Jesus is special in in Matthew, we're already 17 chapters in. They've seen miracles of healing, of multiplying, of scarce resources. We know from chapter 16 that pre Peter professes that Jesus is the Messiah. He already has this recognition, but now they know. And they see it with their own eyes. Jesus shining brightly. And then they... they hear this this voice that that comes and tells them this is what is going to be next i also think of this story because it talks about jesus shining and and um a few years ago uh, shane claiborne he came out with this great book called the irresistible Revol revolution and it was a story about how he sort of became who he is so so shane and a couple of his friends for I think about the last 20 years now have lived together in um, the ghetto in, in Pittsburgh and they're just a house of welcome they take seriously the words of Jesus and so they live together um, their community everybody kind of does something different they do lots of community gardening they look out for the kids in the neighborhood they do tutoring after school their whole philosophy is if somebody has a need they can come and knock on our door and we'll do what we can they don't have a ton of money to give away, 
but they usually have an extra portion of food, maybe an extra blanket, extra pair of clothes. And Shane tells the story of one night, he and, and one of the housemates are walking down to the grocery store, and they encounter this woman who's, who's on crutches, and, and she makes an inappropriate offer to Shane to try and get a few bucks, and he says no, and, and they go to the store, and they buy this bread, and, and they walk back past her, and they get home, and they realize there's a hole in the bag of the bread, and so it's molded, so they have to walk back. And so on the second walk back, they realize we can't just leave this woman shivering in the cold. And so they invite her to come back to their home. And they walk in and they sit down and they give her something to eat. And she starts to cry. And she says, you all are Christians, aren't you? And Jane said they didn't have anything on the outside of their house. There's no sign. There's no cross in the window. There's nothing that would indicate that on any of the walls in their house. And his friend says, well, how do you know that? And she says, because you all shine. There's something about you that, that you reflect the, the love and the beauty of Christ. And she starts to cry and she tells them that she too once shined. But she has fallen on some really hard times. She's made some bad decisions. So they pray for her. And they love her. And they, she decides to, to leave their presence. And, and Shane says that a few weeks later this knock comes on their door. And, and there's this woman standing there. And he has this moment of recognition that like... And he tries to sort of play it off as like, hey, you, <laughs> you know, kind of, how are you? And she's like, you don't recognize me. And he has to confess that he doesn't. And she says, you don't recognize me because I got my shine back. And she wanted to come by and express some sort of gratitude for for the presence, for the, the small role that they played in her. And um, it's actually really hilarious because she, um, she tells them, you know, I used to be a smoker. And, and she said, I don't have much because I lost most everything that I had. But the one thing that I do have is I used to collect um, Marlboro Miles or something. I, I think it was something on the cigarette packet. And so she cut off all these Marlboro Miles and she had them in this box. And she's like, like this is all I have to give you. And so he takes it, his, and he said that like there are actually markers in his Bible, and he really likes when he goes to churches and he starts preaching. Pastors are like, what? But but to him, it's it's this reminder to to keep the the shine in his life. The reminder that that God still is at work, and and the glory of God matters in this world. So apparently she heard that he was telling this story and he was preaching and she wrote him a letter and she was like, I'm so glad to know that I am a resurrection story that you continue to tell. I got my shine back. I love those words. And so back in our text, every part of history is summed up in Moses' presence at the transfiguration. The fact that Moses is standing there points to the reality that everything that God has said from the beginning has now come in Jesus Christ in the physical form. And Elijah's there. So Elijah stands in for all of the prophets, all of the ones who were speaking of this coming king, of this Jesus Christ. Elijah is now saying, it's here. It's all come together. And if there is any doubt, suddenly the cloud descends. And what do we know from, from the history of scripture? That's how the presence of God is represented. And so this voice affirms, this is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. If those words are familiar, we heard him at Jesus' baptism. And so it all comes together to affirm what? That Jesus truly is God's son, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Listen to how the author of Hebrews sums up Jesus' transfiguration. Hebrews 1, long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in the last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Through, who, through him he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. This moment becomes one of clarity for the disciples. They see God in the form of Jesus. Sometimes we say it, Jesus is God with skin on. 
light emanating from his body, the physical glory of God being now visible in the world. So Peter recognized Jesus in his glory, and he gets really excited. And I'm like, yes, go for it, Peter. And Peter wants to commemorate this moment. But do you miss the part in our text where the voice has to push pause on Peter's plans? God literally has to be like, time out, Peter. It's great. It's subtle, but it's there. Verse 5. While he was still speaking, the voice of God interrupts because we, humanity, we are not the authors of God's plan. We will not be the ones that decide how to love. We will not write the rules on God's justice or mercy. The voice of God interrupts Peter because God has a plan for how Jesus is going to be in this world. So before we get too crazy in how we start moving forward, we have to listen. Did you hear the words of the prayer Greg read this morning? He said, aimless enthusiasm. I really like that term when I encountered it this week. Aimless enthusiasm. Sometimes we do have to confess that the ways that we go, we need to slow down and listen. Because immediately following the glimpse of God's glory is a call. Listen. Experiencing God's power is followed by a call to obedience. Listen to my beloved son. So then it begs the question, friends, are we listening? We need to contemplate. Are we listening to God's voice? not listening for, to. God has been talking a really long time if we're willing to hear it. You can flip back to every page to Genesis 1 and hear what God is saying for creation, for humanity. Listening is an action. Actually, listening requires obedience. So do we take seriously the words of Jesus In Jesus' transfiguration, we are told by God to listen to Jesus. That, friends, is our mission, our purpose, our calling. We are also given words of compassion and comfort if that gets overwhelming. Jesus' disciples, they're afraid. That's their initial reaction to the glory and the power. Fear of God is not the point. Jesus Christ is with us and for us, inviting us into the work to bring God's kingdom come. Our job is to alert everyone of God's universal reign through Christ. Wherever we are, be it in school, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our homes, even the grocery store, Starbucks, wherever we are, our actions and our words should be a reflection of Jesus Christ. So we have a a new members class this morning, so I'm really glad I worked this one in. But our book of confession, you all know I love it. Someday, we're going to go through it. And here's why. Because there's some really beautiful language and invitations to who we are. So in the confession of 1967, and you've got to kind of skip down to the ninth chapter, wherever the church exists, Its members, that's you and me, are both gathered in corporate life and dispersed in society for the sake of mission in the world. The church gathers to praise God, to hear God's word for humankind, to baptize, to join each other at the Lord's Supper, to pray for and present the world to God in worship, to enjoy fellowship, we're good at that, to receive instruction strength and comfort to order and organize its own corporate life to be tested, renewed, and reformed, and to speak and act in the world's affairs as may be appropriate to the needs of the time. The church disperses to serve God wherever its members are, at work or play, in private or in the life of society. That's what we believe as Presbyterians, friends. We confess that that is true. Some of us arrive this morning overcome by fear. 
maybe hurt, maybe we're grieving, or at the very least a bit confused about what's going on in the world. And we step into this place, this building, this church, to refocus on Christ in the middle of whatever we're going through. I hope when you walk through those doors into this community that you encounter the glory of God. Maybe a lyric in a song inspires you. The beauty of the stained glass reminds you of the beauty of creation all around you in this world. Or perhaps it's during the words spoken during prayers, maybe a sermon that spark a little hope. God's kingdom, it's coming. It's active. It's seeping into the, the words of Christ. I hope no matter how you came in those doors this morning, that you leave and walk out them a little restored, refilled, refueled, and feeling loved. Because that is the point. May we be transfigured ourselves. May we reflect that same light and love and glory that we see in the face of Christ. Please pray with me. God, we're thankful that you...